Abagahavita, who will moderate this panel discussion. Kanchana is a senior economist at the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, an attorney at law, and a founding chairperson of Working Sri Lanka. In her central bank career, Kanchana was attached to the Economic Research Department, where she worked in the areas of external trade, money, and banking. Prior to this, as an attorney at law, Kanchana also had a private law practice in the fields of commercial and administrative law. Incidentally, Kanchana and I first met at the London School of Economics in 2009 when we were both reading for our master's degrees. Two Sri Lankans were overtly fond of their cups of tea, news from home, and IEOs and ANAs in a very cosmopolitan environment. Kanchana obtained her Bachelor of Administ sorry, Business Administration degree from the University of Colombo and as Achieving Scholar completed an MSc in Local Economic Development from the London School of Economics where she is currently reading for her PhD. Kanchana, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Am I heard? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for returning after lunch. Uh, there's always a tricky situation. <laughs> Some people decide to walk away, so thank you. Um, so this uh, panel is here to discuss the institutional framework. In the morning, we had uh, questions regarding immigration, how do I get a work permit, um, or entrepreneurship, a lot of questions came up about that. So what is the institutional framework? And as we know, institutions are both public and private. And how does this work? I'm founding chair of Learn Asia, an ICT policy and regulation think tank, which is active in 12 emerging Asian economies. His recent book, uh, is ICT English ICT infrastructure in emerging Asia policy and regulatory roadblocks. Uh, Rohan uh, was the team leader at the Sri Lanka Ministry of Economic Re uh, Reform, Science and Technology from 2002 to 2004, and has been responsible for many infrastructure reforms, including participation in the design of the US dollars, 83 million E-Sri Lanka initiative. He was the director general of telecommunications in Sri Lanka from 98 to 99, a founder director of the ICT agency of Sri Lanka, who is also the national partner of this event. He is an honorary professor at the University of Moratua in Sri Lanka, uh, sorry, from 2003 to 2004 visiting professor of economics of, of infrastructure at the Delft University of Technology in Netherlands, 2000-2003, associate professor of communication and public policy at the Ohio State University in US. It's a very long yet shortened profile that I'm reading. Um, he's also a policy advisor at the Ministry of Post, uh, Post and Telecommunication in Bangladesh, and that was from 2007 to 2009. He also serves as a senior advisor to Sarvodaya on ICT matters and is a board member of the Communication Policy Research South, an initiative to identify and foster policy intellectuals in emerging Asia. He is a member of the board and former chair of the Lanka Software Foundation and board member of the International Communication Association. So a lot of experience. He will be our featured speaker. Professor Samarjeeva, if I can have you on stage. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. I, uh, I uh, jumped at the opportunity of talking about return because I have much experience in returning. Uh, I've returned to Sri Lanka three times. Uh, once was uh, within a week of uh, defending my PhD. And uh, I went back in uh, two years and so on. Uh, but of course, you understand that when you return many times, you also have the experience in leaving many times, which I have done. Uh, but I thought that it would not be appropriate only to speak from experience, but that I should try to bring to bear some systematic knowledge uh, to this problem. And uh, when I was thinking about this, uh, I was thinking that some of the, there are interesting parallels between attracting investment and attracting people, people, Sri Lankans, to come back or people like Bridget to come back, come and work here and 
contribute their knowledge. So there are some uh, parallels and some similarities. And also, given the questions that we, we, we heard in the morning regarding um, entrepreneurship and coming back and setting up companies, I think it would be, I thought it would be useful to think about these two things in parallel. So I will run through my presentation with these two themes in mind. So uh, basically, you, uh, you heard in the morning that people come back, they make their decisions, uh, not on a systematic analysis with all the facts and figures, but basically from their heart. And to a great extent, that's how investors do it too. Uh, however much we think we are systematic about it, in the end, there's so much, so many imponderables and so much imperfect information is that you're basically taking a leap. Um, <clears throat> so one of the most important things in business is to establish a legal presence. Uh, I work in places like Myanmar, where these are not simple matters, right? Uh, in the case of um, coming back, for some people, like me, who never gave up my uh, citizenship, that was not a problem. I always had my passport. Uh, but for some others who may have taken another citizenship or who didn't have it in the first place or who's a child of somebody of Sri Lankan origin, uh, that is a major issue. How do you establish a legal presence here? In all these areas, uh, what we tend to have both in, uh, in uh, investment and in other areas is that we have in our country a huge amount of discretion that the government keeps for itself. And one of the things why, they, why we are undeveloped is, I think, because we keep too much discretion for ourselves, for the government. So when you have too much discretion and not enough transparency about how that discretion is, is exercised and how about accountability for those decisions, you tend to have um, well, higher risk, let's say, say, put it that way, higher risk. One could go one more step and say there's an opportunity for various kinds of rent seeking, but let's just stay with higher risk, or at least with perceptions of higher risk. So when you have perceptions of higher risk, what happens is that your returns have to be commensurately high. And the people who pay for that are the people who are going to benefit from the investment or the person coming into the country. The investment that comes in wants exclusivities, wants all kinds of special privileges to address the higher risk, or they want higher returns, and the person who comes, comes in may or may not come in, because now the risks have to, are, not, are not being met by uh, enough of a return. So we could have, um, in the past, when these decisions were looked at, we could have changed sort of done a comprehensive overview of our laws and looked at all the things where discretion was involved, where it was not necessary to have three levels of government approving something and so on. But instead, what we did is we created the BOI, what I call a sort of a zone of exception. It was originally the Greater Colombo Economic Commission. So it was intended to be a one-stop shop, and it was supposed to carve out uh, a separate space. If you come in through that door, life will be simpler. And in actual fact, even today, if you are coming to work for a BOI company versus you're, not, you're coming to work for anybody other than a BOI company, your situation is completely different. Your visa procedures, all these things will be much easier if you come in through the BOI door, because that's the, the exception that we have created. Now, it's intend, it was originally intended to be a one-stop shop, but various ups and downs over the last uh, few decades. It's no longer a pure one-stop shop. And there is also this other issue that is coming up, which is that you could even have, for example, take a simple case of a fully Sri Lankan-owned company which wants to get some foreign interns or foreign workers because they want to move into something new. Now, the first thing that their lawyers will advise them is go get BOI status, get foreign money in, stop being 100% Sri Lankan-owned, become a BOI company, then your life will be simple. That doesn't seem to be quite sensible. I mean, unnecessarily going in for, for partnerships, simply because you want uh, a lesser regulatory burden. 
but that's the way the world is. Now, the organization that I run is not in the BOI, so I speak from personal pain. <laughs> so um, we have also, in many other cases, you can also have countries bound by the rules of multilateral law or bilateral trade uh, rules. For example, covering uh, what we call mode three and mode four. Mode three is when companies come in. The, you can put language in the bilateral agreements or multilateral agreements which say that the employees of that company, certain kinds of employees, will have, be able to move here uh, without hassle. There's very little discretion about them coming in. But we have not signed those things, and we don't really believe in, in, to, in removing discretion through that route. Mode four is, of course, very controversial. As some of you may remember, we had some pretty uh, high, high octane debates a few years ago about the India-Sri Lanka uh, Economic Partnership Agreement, which is the first time that we looked at service sector uh, trade. And there, the issue really was about mode four. One of the key issues was mode four, where would, we would allow natural persons of certain professional qualifications to move between the two countries. So uh, <clears throat> I, for, for the problem at hand, for our problem, which is about people coming back and working in Sri Lanka, one of the things that we could do is to do a comprehensive overview and remove all the unnecessary laws. Won't happen. Uh, second best would be to create some kind of facilitation unit within the Department of Immigration and Immigration to, uh, to facilitate this, if this is something the government is interested in. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the dual citizenship issue in the sense that right now, officially, it is suspended. But we have been informed as of today that it is activated and that it will be formally, you can get dual citizenship in Sri Lanka. That's what we've been told as of today. So some relevant differences between investment and return. Uh, some of the people who looked at this draft have debated with me. But I'm arguing that uh, with people coming in, <laughs> I should argue. I've come three times. Uh, 